evil, street evil. And the way he choreographs the crowds, the followers, the disciples, using figures like Harvey Cartel, Harry Dean Stanton, etc. The way he creates these crowds, um, of course, does know something to the Caravaggio's use of um, everyday models, of course, for uh, many of his paintings. And there is even something in one of the most strangest and most controversial scenes in the film, the, uh, the scene where Figure takes his heart out of his chest, visceral visualization of the sacred heart. Um, there is something that is, I think, slightly kind of just about, about moments like this in the film. But actually, I think, um, as I said, the influence, and of course the major influence on Scorsese's Last Temptation is actually Pasolini's um, Gospel according to Matthew. Um, Scorsese was deeply impressed by Pasolini's approach, which again is using non professional actors. Um, very different from the traditional style of uh, Hollywood biblical ethics. You can carefully choreograph groups of actors. And this the major influence in terms of the style and structure of, of Last Temptation. Um, who almost certainly have been Pasolini's but for the book of St. Matthew. But here I think is really where we start with a deeper engagement with Caravaggio and Scorsese. That's why I really slightly put to one side this argument that it all begins with taxi driver. Because the most important, the breakthrough film for Scorsese as a young filmmaker was Mean Streets. Film made before he was involved with Schrader. And he says, very interestingly, and this is a quote that I've given you um, on screen so that you can compare it to what you're seeing on screen. Um, Caravaggio was there, he says, in the way I wanted the camera movement, the choice of how to stage a scene, basically people sitting in bars at tables, getting up, the calling of Matthew in this Caravaggio painting but in New York. And I think this really gets to the heart of the matter. If you look at Mean Streets, and the extraordinary scenes in bars, cameras tilting and moving, the way that people are presenting to the camera, that's what says in reading Caravaggio in a much more interesting way than simply playing with Carlos Guerrero. He's looking at the composition of Caravaggio's paintings. He's looking at this very distinctive way that Caravaggio had of assembling groups exactly the kind of motif that attracts photographers who are restaging Caravaggio. But Scorsese is talking about how to stage a scene. I think that's the crucial phrase. That, I think, is a, is a, a deep, more interesting connection to Caravaggio than simply a lighting style. How to stage a scene. Scorsese is fascinated by this question. How to stage a scene. And he's done it in many different ways in different periods of his career. And I think this is where he really has learned something. But what I want to show you, this is what Peter's in, is a film that I think has been totally neglected and ignored um, in thinking about uh, influences on Scorsese. And that's his film, Bringing Out the Dead. It's a rather forgotten film, but uh, basically the end of the last century, 1999. It was shot on location in the brownstone of um, Manhattan. I was actually present for part of the shooting on the side. I could testify to what it looked like when they were moving in and out of these brownstone buildings. It's a haunted film. It's a film in which a uh, burnt out paramedic played by Nick Cage. Uh, 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 Nick Cage. Cage. Um, is um, haunted by memories of people he has not saved who rise up like ghosts on the street. I want to show you a scene which I think is, is very interesting in the context that we're talking about. This is the scene, the second night, there were three nights in the structure of the film. The second night, he's with a, an ambulance driver, a black ambulance driver, rather charismatic figure, and they're called to the scene in the golf club where someone's taken a heroin overdose that appears to be dead. Sound. Uh, we have to shut off. 
It's not trying to be accurate, because how could it be accurate? So it was known then, it's still known. What it's trying to do is to evoke a uh, climate of sexual danger. She does, I think, very interestingly. Of course, it runs into the problems of all artist biopics. Um, and John was very well aware of this. I should show you the beginning of it, but we don't know it. Syracuse, Messina, Naples. What a work again. July the 18th, 1610. Four years on the run. So many labels on the luggage and hardly a friendly face. Always on the move. Running into the poisonous blue sea. Running into the July sun. Adrift. Salt water drips from my fingers, leaving a trail of tiny tears in the burning sand. The fishermen carry me high on their shoulders. I can hear you sobbing, Jerusalem. Rough hands warm my dying body, snatched from the cold blue sea. They're rowing me back to the village. The breath warm on my blue lips. I'm dying in time to the plash of their oars. If arms as steady as these have embraced me in life. To think, Jerusalem, our friendship should end in this room. This cold white room so far from home. In many ways, Making a, a biopic was not John's natural gift, and he never made another film of this type. It was about holding up uh, a banner in the way that I tried to describe. Uh, he knew that the only way to do this was to make something that more or less conformed to the uh, dramatic structure of a biopic. So in uh, flashback, Caravaggio uh, was dying, and he reflects back on different faces of his life. There are recreations of <coughs> painting of some of his most famous paintings, and there are recreations of some of his models, models that we know from the paintings. Um, but what I wanted, really wanted to leave you with, thinking about John, is not whether his Caravaggio is a success or not a success. There are many aspects of which are not successful, I think. Um, but what came before it and what came after it, just as with Scorsese, we can find a deeper Caravaggism, if you like, in, in John's uh, film work. Before it, for instance, comes, just before it, comes a film he made partly when he was with me in Russia called Imagining October. It's a film partly shot in Russia, on Super 8, but a, the whole second half of the film is set in an artist's studio. And it's very, it's a wonderful piece of work, made on 16 millimeter, very quickly, very cheap. <coughs> It really has the essence of what he's trying to show in Caravaggio in microcosm. If you're interested in John's work and want to see him showing uh, a painter's eye, a painter's sexual eye, then look at Imagining October. Or look at Jubilee, <coughs> which is another uh, film about um, sort of anti uh, Jubilee film, the made at the time of the Kingdom of Jubilee, and it's punk opera. Um, full of energy, full of uh, outrageous um, behavior on the part of the young cast, full of graffiti, full of blasphemy. Um, there is a lot of the world of Caravaggio as John understood it uh, in uh, Jubilee. And two other films that pick up on aspects of this, what I'm calling his Caravaggism. One is the angelic conversation. That's the film in which he explored Shakespeare's sexuality through the sonnets. Very interesting film indeed, in which the sonnets are recited with a series of very interesting visuals linked to the, the recitation. And then a, a later film, his last dramatic feature really, Edward II, Marlowe's Edward II, performed. Um, it's something somewhat uh, in the manner of his Caravaggio, but going much further. This is a film full of uh, sexual banditry, bad behavior, um, 
And by taking a classic text, Marlowe's uh, Edward II, in a way, John was able to do what he had not been able to do with Caravaggio. He was able to break the rules in all sorts of ways and not have to follow uh, historical template. And as I say, his film has both the virtues and the considerable limitations of its need to match certain moments to the paintings of the Universal World. This is perhaps where uh, these are the weakest, in many ways, uh, aspects of the film. Um, terrible slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a bad slide. But I'm sitting in front of the painting uh, earlier this afternoon. I'm almost unbearable to look at. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know that art history always used to be taught in black and white slides. It's uh, an article of faith in art history that no color slides would be the most adequate. So let's just have black and white. I was always taught until modern times. And there's some point to that. But I just want to pose the question finally. Um, if we stand, as you're able to do, and I have done on a number of occasions, in that uh, chamber in, in the Cathedral, and if you look at the two great um, Caravaggios that you have here uh, in the oratorio, um, do they have anything to say to us? to us who are more than a century into the era of city. <coughs> is there anything that we bring to their paintings from our experience of cinema? Do they uh, feed into the development of cinema? If I had longer, I could explore that in more detail. Let me just show you two slides um, initially. These are from two Russian filmmakers. This is Eisenstein's bad slide too, but anyway, from Eisenstein's <laughs> rather terrible. Uh, the second part of, of this great uh, epic of the life of the first Russian Tsar. And of course, Eisenstein, deeply versed in the history of art, with a long encyclopedic knowledge of the history of art, such as one could have up to that time he made it in the early 1940s uses many different references that come from a whole range of art historical sources. And he plays with shadows massively in recreating this world, this uh, early Renaissance world of the Russian court. But what I'm really interested in is the question of space. Eisenstein creates new and interesting spaces in his film. And it seems to me that this is an aspect that we have to think about. If we want to be serious about Caravaggio, we should be thinking about the kind of space different kinds of space that Caravaggio created in his paintings. Different kinds of illusionistic <coughs> space. And we find that filmmakers are working with illusionistic space also. Not just through lighting, but through set construction, through camera angle, uh, moving us around in space. I'll show you here a, a rather better slide from a film that you may not know by Alexander Sikorov, who I think is the greatest Russian filmmaker of work today. This is from a film he made in uh, the 1990s called um, Whispering Pages. It's a kind of version of Crime and Punishment. It's a sort of skeletal version of the Crime and Punishment. It is some of the most extraordinary spatial structures. And Sakurov does make me think sometimes about Caravaggio's spatial constructions. And there's another image, again very hard to read, in a film called Stone, which is about uh, Chekhov. Museum in Russia. So there are filmmakers I think, who are doing interesting things spatially, um, which can connect us. But I call this talk um, cheating in Caravaggio. I really should end it by talking about quoting Caravaggio. Some of you may know of this uh, quite provocative book by a great Dutch art historian, uh, Nika Bal, and her argument in it, in a very small nutshell, is that many contemporary artists have made a almost a fetish in quoting Caravaggio. Not directly quoting, but alluding to Caravaggio in very modern work. What's going on when they do this? What she says is that, of course, there's an interaction between our present and the past. Our present changes the past. The past is not settled, fixed, it's changed by our relationship to it. 
But that book is an exploration of the zigzags of the way that we alter the past to what we see in our present. So I would apply that back and say, as she does in the book, that of course we can't look at Caravaggio without, the, without our century of cinema experience. It makes a few things different. We look through the things in them, we see different things in them, we think cinematically, but we know it's not art, even when we're looking at art big 500 years ago. And that, I think, is, is an important lesson to take away as well. It's not just a question of looking for films that look like Caravaggio, although it can be that. It's a question of getting into a, a deeper kind of dialogue. Meanwhile, the story continues. <laughs> the snow is all being. Thank you.